Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our first talk of the spring semester. My name is Dr. Shadid Adwani. I'm an assistant professor of political science and the director of the, of the Center for Gulf Studies. Welcome, everyone. We're going to begin our talk pretty soon, and before I introduce our wonderful speaker, I'd like to ask you all, if you have questions, please save your questions for the end. If your phones are on, if you would please silent those, put those phones on silent. For those that are here for a stamp, we'll be stamping after the event. So I'll give you all a couple minutes to make sure those phones are off. We're very lucky this evening to welcome Dr. Henning Khabar, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Mass Communications at Kuwait University. She was recently the recipient of the Outstanding Article Award at the National Communication Association's Feminist Division in the United States just this year, right, this last academic year. She's the author of Muslim Women and White Femininity, Reenactment and Resistance, and that's going to be our topic this evening, and specializes, she specializes in rhetoric and cultural studies with a focus on intersectionality. Dr. Henning's methodological research is conducted through rhetorical criticism, ethnography, and autoethnography. She's been featured on more than six top paper panels and has won more than four top awards. She has eight years work experience in both the government and private sector in Kuwait in public relations and in campaign planning. I myself have known Henning for over 10 years, maybe more, maybe it's, maybe it's 20. Uh, so I'd like for you all to please welcome our wonderful, wonderful speaker, Dr. Henning. speaking or speaking in English, because I've been teaching for two years in Arabic, so I'm actually excited about both. So, um, start the timer. So, basically, this talk is about my book, Muslim Women and White Femininity, Reenactment and Resistance. Now, I came to this book for, so the title, so the title of the book is Muslim Women and White Femininity, Reenactment and Resistance. Um, I came to this book because for, for a number of reasons. First, uh, for years, my body was this Muslim carrier of white femininity. So I adopted, I enacted, and I performed white feminism on a daily basis. And I'm going to go through all those terms in a bit. I know they're all complicated and they're difficult, but we're going to break them down. So, second, being exposed to a critical communication program during my PhD, I actually um, started to become very interested in the embodiment of different privileges, which I'm also going to go into in a bit. So, what I was interested in was how does whiteness travel globally through bodies and subjects who speak the language of the imperialist and not the vernacular. So, what I break, I'm, I'll break it down into three main questions. So, basically, what I was trying to do was look at what happens when Muslim women speak for Muslim women, right? Because I'm not looking at white women, I'm looking at Muslim women speaking for Muslim women. Second, what are the consequences of Muslim women embodying whiteness? And three, are they representing their society or embodying views about their society in the global limelight? So I'm looking at these three things. Now, when I'm referring to them as Muslim, I'm not referring to this as a religious phenomenon, I'm referring to it as a cultural phenomenon because at times, the women and the examples that I'll show you are at times rejecting Islam. So think about Muslim as a cultural phenomenon. Now, when I'm, when, I'm saying what, when I'm speaking about white Western feminism, I'm speaking about this universalized feminism that has emerged out of whiteness and is the only prevailing, prevailing feminism that we hear throughout the media. We haven't been exposed to any other feminism. And so white feminism came out in the first and the second movement of basically the feminist movements in the US where women and men wanted to be equal, right? That, that's the whole underlying, you know, the whole basis of feminism. And so what happened is when 
The first and the second wave came out, it was about men, have, uh, men and women, I was men having their rights, that was funny. Okay, <laughs> so we're already talking about feminism, now I'm talking about men having their rights. So women having their first, their voting rights, and second, rep reproduct reproductive rights and other rights. So in the third wave, we have women of color come in. I'm talking like Latina, I'm talking a black woman, Arab woman, Muslim woman, Native American, Asian, and they're like, hey, this, is, this, this feminism doesn't apply to us. So this happened in the 90s. So we have these women of color coming up and saying, what are you doing? This doesn't apply to us. You're looking at men and women in one category, but we have other intersections, which I'm gonna go into in a bit. Meaning, a woman who has a, so someone that is a doctor that is Kuwaiti, um, is different than someone that is, doesn't have an education, right? That's not Kuwait, or someone that's Bedouin. A white woman in the U.S. is going to have a completely different experience and different needs than a black woman working in the same company. So we have to look at these intersections. And this is what women like Alkaf and Zodua, Califel, Colin, Crenshaw um, were looking at. So this theory was developed by Kimberly Crenshaw. And so what I'm trying to do is, I'm using, in terms of theory, intersectional feminism. Okay, um, I'm using whiteness, right? So I'm using whiteness as this ideology. So when I refer to whiteness, and in a bit I'm gonna go into ideology also, okay? For the students especially. So when I'm referring to whiteness, I'm speaking of the system of power that privileges performances of Western civility. Um, it could be through a white Anglo-Saxon learn learning. It could be racial superiority, such as favoring philosophies of um, white people or those who read performance. Right? So it's not always white people, it could be other, other intersections or other people. It's also a system that further produces the scripted standard norm for what is a acceptable performance. Okay? So when I'm talking about standard performances though, I'm also, I'm also speaking about the, the embodiment of other privileges, right? Education, white, male, cisgender. Think of Trump. He has all the intersections of privilege, right? And so, as I use whiteness for this project, I'm using it as a force that moves within, beyond structures, um, a, a place where we can actually embody it and um, trespass into white spaces and actually resist, and a place where we can be controlled by it. So, what I did now, the problem with being a rhetorician is we combine our theory and methodology. I kind of tried to break it down for you, but so we combine the whole theory where I was talking about whiteness and intersectionality, etc. And what I what I'm doing in the book is a rhetorical criticism and a autoethnography. So to make it simple, when I when I when I say rhetorical criticism, I'm basically just breaking apart the text. I'm just trying to see what's controlling the text. What is this image? What are the overarching power structures in the image? Um, I'll show you examples. What what is controlling the, the text? Who is speaking, right? Who's giving the speech? If we're looking at a speech, for example. And then um, what I'm doing is I'm doing this post-colonial, so autoethnography, back to autoethnography. So I'm combining rhetorical criticism, right? We're breaking apart the text with autoethnography. Autoethnography is basically personal narrative where you're actually relating your own experience to power. It could be poetry, it could be personal narrative, it could be a bunch of things. So in the book, I go back and forth between rhetorical criticism and autoethnography, so I'm trying to combine them. For the talk, I'm just gonna go into the rhetorical criticism part, okay? So I'm introducing a new type of rhetorical criticism, a, a archetypal criticism, and it comes from a post-colonial lens. So post-colonial is basically the theory, is, is basic, post-colonial scholars basically want to speak back to power structures, right? They wanna dismantle power in any form, whether it's white racism, whether it's discrimination, whether it's sexism, they just want to speak back, right? Okay? So archetypal criticism, what I'm trying to do here is develop this critical method, method where I'm critiquing standards that are performed by oppressed minorities, marginalized identities, in the name of dominant performances, okay? So, is everyone with me though? Yeah? Okay, good. So, archetype, archetypal criticism allows us to interrogate global stereotypes global spectacles. It allows us to, to take the text, break it apart, and see, okay, this is dominating popular culture, this is dominating media, this is dominating music, etc. Okay? So it doesn't mean that the criticism 
is always bad, right? Or it, or it always needs to be um, against hegemonic structures or power structures. It can also be conforming. It can also be a place where we can, we can create resistance, right? And so I'll show you what I mean by there's these gray areas. It's not black and white. So how do archetypes circulate? And if you don't know what an archetype is, just think of a stereotype. It's like a larger stereotype that circulates in the media. So how do archetypes circulate? First, I want you to think about it at a really, really large level, right? I want you to think of power like, you know how you can't touch the clouds? So I want you to think of power at the largest level. So you have hegemony. Hegemony, I know, it's a really like, intimidating word, right? But it's so simple, it just means power. So hegemony is power. So if we have power, we have, we have, um, we have thoughts. And uh, see now I'm thinking about the words in Arabic. See what happens when you, when you teach in Arabic for two years. So you have power, which is ideal, which is hegemony. Then you have these ideas that circulate. So when I said think about the cloud, it's like something you can't touch, right? It's a thing that you can't, it's not really tangible, it's immaterial, you can't really touch it, but you know it's there, right? So when we're talking about male ideology, when we're talking about um, white ideology, Kuwaiti ideology, when we're talking about able body um, ability, right? We're talking about all these different ideologies, right? Um, upper class. I can go one, okay? So we have a hege hegemonic domain. So that's the first domain. Then the structural domain, which are the institutions, the legal markets, the media, right? Government policies. They lock down these power structures that are circulating. So when they lock them down, the disciplinary, okay? So think of like the TA and the doctor, right? The TA is like, Assist, the disciplinary locks it down and manages the power um, through surveillance, through prison, through workforce, through academia. And then at the smallest level, we have the interpersonal domain, right? You know what interpersonal means. The day-to-day -day interactions, the little tiny microaggressions, you know? When, you know, yesterday, it happened to me yesterday, you know? It was like, hello, Dr. Badr, hello, Hanin. These little tiny microaggressions, right? And how you see them permeate through every single domain. And so this is intersectionality, right? So what happens is I told you we have power at a larger level. You're all with me, right? Okay, just check. So you have power at a larger level and then we carry this power in our bodies, right? We don't know that we carry it in our bodies. If you think you don't carry it in your bodies, you're not reflecting on your privileges. So we have these privileges, right? So ability, we have male privilege, it could be racial privilege, which changes, right, from country to country. Okay, for the purpose of the book, I'm looking at white privilege. We have upper, middle class, etc. So we carry this, every single one of us carries these privileges with us, right? So this power that we're talking about at this large level is then carried into our bodies. So we carry them in our bodies without even knowing, right? Which is why <laughs> reflecting and reflexivity is very important. Now, what happened, is if you see the red circles, you have the oppressed. Who are you oppressing? So you have male privilege, you have female oppression. You have ability privilege, you have disability privilege, right? You have racial privilege, you have people of color. Um, class privilege, education privilege, etc. Now what's happening, what I did in the book is I'm looking at, so it hurts when you're getting oppressed, right? I mean, we've all experienced oppression in some form of way. It, you know what I mean? So what happens is sometimes we embody the oppressor, right? So you know sometimes when you're like, oh, she was internalizing patriarchy. Um, <laughs> that's what I mean. You know, I've done it sometimes. I mean, I did it the other day, and then I was like, oh my god, did I just do that? We can, so it, what I'm looking at in the book is what when do Muslim women or people of color embody white racism, embody white feminism or femininity, right? And so this is what I'm trying to do. And so what I did in the book is I developed three archetypes just to narrow it down, okay? So first, I was looking at the oppressed, right? So what are these, what are these stereotypes and archetypes that are circulating in the media? So we have the oppressed. So we have Malala Yousafzai, who was a young Pakistani woman who was shot by the Taliban, and I'll go into her story in a bit. And we have the advocate, so think of the like white feminists, right? And we see like a lot of Muslim Middle Eastern Arab women embodying that white feminist role, right? And then we have the humanitarian. So I'm sorry. And so for the advocate, we have Ayan Hirsi Ali. So I look at Ayan Hirsi Ali's book, The Infidel. I'll go into that in a bit. And then we have the humanitarian. So think of like Princess Diana, 
So I looked at Queen Rani as this extension of, the, of, of how Princess Diana used to perform, okay? So first, in, in the book, and what I want to show you are examples, right, of white officials like Hillary Clinton. So I go into more in the book, like George W. Bush, um, Liz Cheney, Barbara Bush. I go into all these U.S. officials and how they speak for, um, they speak for, right? Because we're speaking for, because we're in a privileged positionality. Now we know what's privilege and oppression is. So we're speaking for, not with. So the message doesn't get there, right? The culture gets lost in translation. And Linda Alcoff writes a lot about this, where she talks about we need to speak with and not for. Even if you're in a privileged position now, you need to learn how to speak with and not for, right? And so when I'm, what's important to know is these archetypes that I'm showing you, it's not black and white. They're not just performing whiteness. There's times where they're resisting it. So it, there's no black and white. There is a gray area. I mean, maybe with the Anthony I it's like a different case, right? We'll see that in a bit. But these archetypes, they disidentify. Disidentify meaning they conform and they don't conform at the same time. And so here I looked at white US officials. So I'm gonna give you an example of just a little part of um, Liz Cheney's speech. And in this capacity, she was the principal deputy assistant secretary for uh, Near Eastern Affairs and coordinator for broader Middle East and North African issues. Like the longest title ever that they gave her. It was weird. Anyway, so I'm going to read you a part. Now, in the book, I have obviously longer parts, more parts, but I tried to give you the ones that I really, really think are powerful. So here she says, our enemies are offering a vision of the world in which women are no better than slaves or chattel, in which fathers and brothers can murder their female relatives for violating family honor, in which little girls can't go to school and can be forced to marry at 9 or 10 or 11. The women of the broader Middle East will not stand for this and are fighting to turn their nation's faces toward the future. America is proud and honored to stand with them. So she was giving a speech about Muslim women at a conference. It was in 2005, so we also had, you know, we wanted to go in, or not we, but the U.S. wanted to go into the Middle East, right? So it's important to also note that Muslim women are always at the forefront of Western media whenever they want to come into our region, politically, economically, and strategically. So it's important for all of us to know this and to call it out, right? So here, she's basically saying, okay, yeah, so modernization and West has given us an increased number of benefits, right? Like education. I mean, most of us there have a lot of, I know, a lot of my colleagues here, we've, we've all been educated in the UK and the US, and there's a lot of benefits to modernization, right? So let, let's, it, again, it's not, it's not black and white, there's a gray area. But what happens here is we're giving the right for the West to basically enter our region economically, strategically, politically. Now this is what I mean by a rhetorical criticism, is how do we break down the text, what, right? Why are we calling all Muslim women slaves? Why are we calling all Muslim women little girls that can't go to school? It makes them educated, it means that basically none of the women are educated. Do you see what I mean? There's this generalization. So that's what I mean by, we're, this is a rhetorical criticism. I'm basically walking you through a rhetorical criticism. Now, my favorite part ever, okay? George W. Bush, the father, not the son, okay? Now, basically, I took, again, little parts for sake of time, and he says in one of his speeches, where he's again talking about, you know, the Muslim world and, you know, of course it's all about women's rights, right? And so he says here, the Taliban were incredibly barbaric. It's hard for the American mind to understand barbaric. Watch the movie. So remember the Bin Laden movie? He was referring to the Bin Laden movie, which was very problematic. Um, because the US and the Taliban were, were seen as ha like having the same army, like the same strength, which was also really strange. But then he says, women were forbidden from appearing in public unescorted, that's barbaric. Women were prohib prohibited from holding jobs. It's impossible for young girls to get an education, that's barbaric, it's not right, okay? And then take note of the use, how many times did you use the word barbaric? And this is a small part that I take out like four or five times, right? So where have you heard this terminology? Anybody? Have you heard it in any Disney movie? Aladdin. So this is what this is the best that the U.S. can do in their national policy. They're taking Disney films. Well, Disney does control like half the world. They're taking Disney films, okay, and they're basically using terminology.
that we with Indy. So in the in Disney in Aladdin, in the first song, the lyrics were, "I come from a land from a faraway place where the caravan camel, caravan camels roam, where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home." So all the like anti the Arab American like discrimination organizations in in the U.S. anti discrimination. I mean. Um, started speaking out, and they were like, you cannot put this, how could you put, they cut off their ears, and they made this whole issue when they had the first showing of Aladdin. What did they do? They took it out, but guess what they kept in there? Which word? Barbaric. Barbaric! It's like, seriously? That's what I mean. When we break up the text and we pinpoint where the power is happening, it's hard to do it if we don't have the training, right? And I try to do that with my students. So, okay, how are we going to train you to see all these things, whether it's an image or a book or a text, etc. And so, basically, this is what we're doing. We're taking Disney lines and we're putting them into, or they are, into U.S. national policy. I keep saying we, maybe I'm being like colonized right now, right? Or body white. So, basically, that's what I mean. Is it stuck? I mean, it's a little stuck, but I can keep going. So. Maybe it's this. So basically, I'm talking, so I go into three archetypes. I think the PowerPoint stuff. So I'll keep talking. So I go into three archetypes. Um, so first, I go into the oppressed archetype. So I go into Malala's, um, Malala Yusufzai. So does everyone know who Malala is? Yes. So Malala basically, should I stop or keep going? I keep going, okay. Malala basically, um, so Malala is a young Pakistani girl, she's 13, okay. Um, can you give me my notes? They're like right there, white notes. Thank you, you're the best. So Malala was a young girl, she always had a backup. Oh, now it's working, as soon as I got the backup. So, Malala was a young girl, she was 13, she was shot by the Taliban because she blogged about education. Obviously that's not right, right? It, it was tragic. What happened is then, the Western media took her story. And I think that's where the problem happened, okay? So it's not that she's necessarily doing something bad, because she's speaking for women's rights, right? But it's this generalization that she started to do, and this agency that the Western media took from her, by putting her and framing her in the way that they, they wanted to do, right? Which comes from framing theory, where we frame a story in the way that we want to, right? And so she was basically, so, so basically I'm looking at, I found four th themes. So I watched the performance of her speech at the UN Youth Takeover. Now it's different when you watch the performance, because you can see how she moves and how she talks and where does she become emotional and where does she not, right? And you can see like all these people crying in the audience, and so I found four themes. One was performing white femininity through terrorism and education. I found the universality of gender oppression and the rhetoric of sameness, uh, romanticizing government, stru government structures and disidentification. I'm going to go through it. So what she's doing here is she's basically linking, again, terrorism and education to the Middle East. So I'll read you an example. So she says, Malala Day is not my day. Today is the day of every woman, every boy, every girl who have raised their voice for their rights. There are hundreds of human rights activists and social workers who are not only speaking for human rights, but are struggling to achieve their goals of education, peace, and equality. Thousands of people have been killed by the terrorists, and millions have been injured. Now this narrative reinforces the notion that Muslim women are oppressed, again, they have no access to education, terrorism is a, is a Middle Eastern thing, right? And it, what's happening here is we're not attending to the intersection. Remember when we talked about the intersections? We're not looking at the intersections of each woman's unique identity, right? And so I think it's, like, if you could go later and watch the speech, you'll see how she goes really into the emotive, right? Um, she also universalizes gender oppression. So she says um, basically that she's focusing on women's rights and girls' education because they are suffering the most. So again, and I'm not going to redo the whole thing. Again, we're saying women are one group. A, a, a Bedouin, a Kuwaiti, a white woman, a black woman are all the same, right? Uh, an able-bodied woman, a poor woman, a rich woman, they're all the same. It doesn't matter, right? And so we have to be careful when we universalize this um, gender oppression and sameness. Now, here she's romanticizing government structures. 
So she says, we call upon the world leaders that all the peace deals must protect women and children's rights. A deal that goes against the dignity of women and their rights is unacceptable. We call upon governments to ensure compulsory education for every child all over the world. We call upon governments to fight against terrorism and violence to protect children from brutality and harm. Now, the problem is first she's reducing world, world leaders into one common group. You cannot do that, that's, a, that's, that's ridiculous. Second, the consequences become multiple. This is why rhetorical criticism, again, is important. It's where layered context is important. Because first, which world leaders is she referring to? Second, are we assuming that these are third world leaders, or first world leaders? Who are we talking about, right? Also, this leaves the audience to assume that government can change their policies and are gonna save the whole world when they're the ones where we have, where, where, where we're, not, we're not pinpointing the corruption that's happening, right? What are the structural issues that we have in governments all over the world? So this is why I named it romanticizing. Power structure, I like to say governments, but maybe power structures, you know, goes well better, you know? So I don't want you to like come bail me out from jail, but anyways. <laughs> so, so basically, there are moments, so what I like about her is there are moments where she disidentifies. Now, this identification, again, remember we spoke about it, it's where you can resist, but you can also conform. So I can embody whiteness, but I could also resist it. So here, I mean, she's still wearing her hijab, right? That still speaks. It speaks a lot. She's still wearing her hijab. She's still saying, you know, so she has little parts, maybe there's little, it's a little problematic, but she says the more you speak out against Islam and against all Muslims, the more terrorists it will create. So she has moments where she resists, and so that's what we're talking about, this identification, which is a theory that was developed by Munoz, right? And so here, again, you see these little moments where she disidentifies, so it's not black and white, okay? As opposed to the next archetype that I look at, the advocate, the secular feminist, Ayan Hirsi Ali, where I looked at her book, and she has more agency. Why do you think she has more agency? Because she completely rejects Islam completely rejects the culture, rejects everything. And so basically, I'm looking at these different themes, you know, I like Malala, the rhetoric where we're universalizing uh, sameness, uh, women, oppression of women is only Islam specific, it's not, it's not male dominated, it's Islam specific. Okay, Muslim women are subject to domestic abuse, the hijab is monstrous, arranged marriages are a form of control, genital circumcision is Islam specific, etc. So these are just the themes, right? I'm not gonna go into all of them, don't worry. Okay, and then, and so basically, I'm gonna read you. So this this one really spoke to me. So here she's she's talking about. So basically, she was a refugee that um, lived in Saudi Arabia for a long time. She's Somalian, and then she fled to the Netherlands and she sought asylum. Later on, she became a part of the I wonder why. You know, embodiment, whiteness. That's, okay. So basically, here she's talking about when she was in Saudi Arabia. So she says, all the women in this country were covered in black. They were like human-like shapes. You could see which way they were looking only by the direction their shoes pointed. We pulled away and ran over to the black shapes. We stared up at them, trying to make out where their eyes could be. One raised her hand, gloved in black, and we shrieked, they have hands. We pulled faces at her. We were truly awful, but what we were seeing was so alien, so sinister that we were trying to tame it, make it less awful. And what these Saudi women saw, of course, were little black kids acting like baboons. Now think about it. First, she's internalizing, she's monsterizing herself. She's referring to black kids as baboons, right? So she's stereotyping herself, right? So she's referring to these black children and these Saudi women. She's monsterizing these women, right? Because they're human-like shapes. They're not, they're not people, right? They're these things with, they, she almost referred to them as if they were like ghosts, right? Like Casper, but a black Casper, right? And so, there, again, like this narrative creates a narrative of otherness, right? So we're further negating women. And if you look at monstrosity literature, and I used to teach monstrosity in pop culture when I was teaching in the US, it basically stems out of this deep anxiety. If you look at all horror films, they stem out of basically the US's anxiety, right? And history. And the monster, remember this, when you watch the next horror movie, is always from one of those oppressed identities, right? And so, here again, she's monstrizing. Now, unlike Malala, she has this complete rejection and denial of any racism. So she basically here, she's talking about how Naima, her friend, is always insisting that the shopkeepers look at her because they're racist. And she's like, no, that's, that's not 
I, I thought that I thought this was illogical. How can anyone tell? How can anyone be racist? So she she has this denial of racism throughout her book. Um, I mean, yes, throughout her book. I'm like, what was the thing I was analyzing? But basically, she completely rejects her blackness, right? She's unable to identify moments. Now, it's not it, what's really important here is to understand where she came from. It's not that she's like this horrible person who's like out to get anyone. She doesn't know better. She she ha she was genuinely circumcised when she was young, right? So she associated Islam with this incident. It's not that she's a bad person. So she rejected this ideological homeland which she associated with Islam, right? But instead, where is she going to go? Where's the other ideological homeland? Think about it. It's the West, right? And so it's important to also know this about her, that it's not necessarily black and white. And so this is what I mean when I'm talking about the secular feminists, okay? Who embodies whiteness. Now the third one, and I'm going to show you like one or two pictures real fast, is Queen Rania. So I look, so remember when I talked about Princess Diana and this performance of white femininity, we're looking at Queen Rania as, again, this extension of Princess Diana. She has some things that I actually love about her too. So we're looking at four key themes. So colonial modernity, right? How do we perform the modern? Uh, transnational motherhood. What is motherhood? We all have, we, you know, Princess Diana did that very well. And heteronormativity and education. So what I'm gonna do is show you just two pictures. So here we have Queen Rania. She's wearing the hijab in one picture, very loosely. And so what I did is I looked at images of Queen Rania. Obviously, okay? And so what she did, what, so here they're describing her. So Gamer and Vogue magazine are describing her as portrayed as a symbol of modernity because she chose not to wear the hijab, right? So again, it's not her words, but they're, they're basically framing it as, look, this is good, she's not wearing the hijab, this is powerful, she's not wearing hijab, when there's a lot of feminist interpretations for the hijab, and it's very wrong to say that. And so basically it's important to know that also, there's a huge literature on this by Rafa Shom, is basically um, the fashion and, and modernization, right, are sites of power, right? I mean, the fashionable female body is a site where the nation creates a sense of belonging. So it's really important to know this. Now, I really love these two pictures because here we have this whole like Princess Diana, Angelina Jolie, Madonna, like we're gonna go save all the children in Africa and everyone's gonna live happily ever after. That's not gonna happen, okay? So here she's continuing the script on the left, okay? So she's continuing in the script and now Richard Dyer has like a whole literature on just lighting and whiteness. It's really interesting and it's really weird when you read the book. And Basically, she's, again, like you can see, she's lighting up, like she's illuminating the face of this black child, right? Her hand touches the child, it reminds the viewer of this transnational motherhood, right? This modernity, we're going to save all the children, we're all going to live happily ever after, right? Like the Disney movies. And so, then, here, it looks, it feels different, right? It feels different, because it, she's going to a Palestinian refugee camp. So she's originally Palestinian, and there's this mutual affect of understanding of a community that belongs to her. So you don't necessarily see that lighting up that Richard Dyer speaks about, more than you see this kind of mutual affect. And so what I so she performs this and extends this, um, you know, this Princess Diana narrative that we're talking about. But I like that she disidentifies. Like she goes on Oprah Winfrey, right? And she's dressed, you know, like some of us are modern. Speaking English, you know, like my accent goes away when I go to the US, especially when I'm in immigration. <laughs> I have an accent, but I think if I do it now, it's gonna be really embarrassing. So I'm not gonna do it, okay? So she goes on the Oprah Winfrey show and she says, no, we're not impressed. Um, we have different forms of oppression, depending on every country has oppression in a different way, right? She goes to Yale University, she gives a speech about the Palestinian Israeli conflict. She was able to culturally trespass into white spaces. So sometimes embodying whiteness is a tool. Fight back, okay? So sometimes when you need to, like immigration, it's gonna be like, hi officer, how are you? You know? Like take like the whitest book, I don't know what that is, and just it'll help, okay? So basically to end, how can we create these critical tools, right? To unpack all these narratives, right? And so basically I'm often clouded, but I'm also complicit with these ideologies, right? So it's, an, it's, an, an, it's really important for us to reflect and to identify these moments where we can develop our critical thinking further, right? And so it's basically what I'm doing at the end. So in the beginning of the book, 
I go into the whole field of ethics and the problem with the field of ethics because they don't account for identity. So you have this whole field of philosophy and ethics, but nobody accounts for identity. So it's like, okay, so what if you know it's a Palestinian on a checkpoint, there's an Israeli, or it's like you have to keep identity into account. So at the end, I'm going back to remember the diagram intersectionality. I'm going back to this intersectional feminist ethic. Okay, and so I, I'm, I'm introducing it. How do we locate positionality, resistance, and privilege across these intersections? Okay, and identity is the fundamental core value of any ethics. So if we can extend the intersectionality into an intersectional feminist ethic, we can interrogate these power structures, probe deeper into vital, into what is being framed, I mean, as ethical. And also, always remember when ideologies seem very familiar to you, these are the moments that we must question the performances in front of us, right? So that for the unfamiliar is where we can locate our privileges. And basically, to end, let us be at risk with the contradiction of ideologies, performances, etc. And for, for without criticality, there is no humanity. Okay? Thank you. I'm going to end there. that is the one that makes it to the line and it's very problematic for the feminist movements and I don't want to undermine the feminist movements also because they're doing a lot of great work but the problem is they're not reaching the masses and they're not reaching the underprivileged women and the marginalized identity so your comment is exactly its place <laughs> thanks hi Dita. hi, hi. <laughs> um, first thank you for this great lecture I really enjoyed it um, I just have a small comment. Um, it seems to me that you were a little bit harsh on Malala, you know, uh, in the way you criticized her and going through her speed. And uh, I cannot help to see that actually this is happening all over the world. It's like the world is really uh, putting all their problems to, to seem to be on Malala's shoulders. It's like uh, she's just a little girl, you know, uh, and I know it's like. She's been under a lot of pressure, and people want her to be like this perfect image. And I think you went a little bit harsh on her. You know? Yeah, so I, I wasn't harsh on her more than I was harsh on the Western media. Yeah. So if you read the actual book, and I couldn't give you enough examples, because I actually do give examples where she disidentifies, right? But I'm not being hard on her, I'm being hard on how the Western media picked it up and used her. I like bag it, you know what I mean? I completely and so agree. if you read some of the parts in the book, there's parts where she actually disidentifies. Yeah. There's more parts. For the sake of time, I can only put one part. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, 
Hi, Amy. Hi. Um, I just have a question about intersectional uh, femininity and how we can enact it or embody it. Mm -hmm. um, or inter intersectional feminism. So people often ask me, and this is one of the most annoying questions I get when I, I go back to visit the States because I went to college there, and they say, yeah, but how is it to live as a woman in the Middle East? Yeah, I like the way you, the tone too. Is yeah. it hard? Yeah. And then they do like they look at you like this, you know, like. Oh. And it's like, well, you know, I'm a, I'm an empowered woman. I'm a woman whose social status doesn't make it difficult to be a woman anywhere. And the question we need to be asking is, how are are women from less privilege doing everywhere? You know, mm -hmm. like look at the poor woman in your community and go ask them. Mm -hmm. Like I'm good. Yeah. You. you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. So the embodiment. Right. So I, I feel a little bit for me a bit of tension and anger when I mm -hmm. when I I'm in that the, the setting that we we're talking about here, uh, which is like yeah. the, the white feminist setting. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how I'm trying to move past it by like you know volunteering, starting to volunteer here, looking at like migrant shelters, women across class. Um, race, all of it, yeah, and how we can reach out to them, but how can we as a community start to also embody these ideals? Yeah, I, so because I teach at Kuwait University, we have a lot of marginalized students, a massive amount, um, privileged also, but we also have a, a lot of marginalized identities, and because when you said embodiment, I kept thinking of these exercises that I always do, so sometimes like, I'll give all the students an identity, um, five cards, and they have to write different identities that they have, so male or female, uh, I can make them feel so uncomfortable. So I'm like, you have to put if you're Havari or Qabili, and they're like, that's so horrible, why is she asking us that? You have to put if you're Sunni or Shia, like really uncomfortable questions. And then I take identities away from them, like I grab them in a really aggressive way, and so they're like, what the hell, right? Uh, uh, like someone like with ability, I'll take their ability card from them. So then I say like, how did you feel? And they're like, okay, we felt horrible because you just took my citizenship away from me. You took my ability away from me, you know, and, and they're, they're angry, right? So like, I feel like the way to get through to people is how, like make them feel it first, like before. So what I do is I make them feel it first. I even do the walk-up privilege where I give them a, I, like I Kuwaitiized it. That's a word. And so basically, like, you know, if your nationality is a privileged nationality, take a step forward, et cetera, et cetera. If you have maids in the house, take a step forward. If you have a disability, take a step backward. And the students, right, when they see that there's different people in different places in the room, they're shocked, they're stunned. Like, oh my God, he doesn't have a Kuwaiti nationality. He's Bedouin, right? So they feel so horrible. Like, they literally get depressed that day. And then they go back, and then the next day they came up. I'm like, how did you feel? They're like, horrible. I actually finally saw what you meant by oppression. Then I go into that. So basically, what I'm trying to say is, I'm trying to do the same thing you're doing too. You know, like how do I get? How do I get? There? I feel like with with the students at KU, like I get a lot of marginalized identities, so I'm able to interact more. But if you want to go to shelter together, we should do it. <laughs> like the awkward moment, right? <laughs> Someone can ask a question or not. Okay. Well, hi, first of all, thank you so much for the uh, lecture. It was amazing, I'm so impressed actually. Um, I don't know if it's a question or a comment. Uh, it's just that sometimes I'm sick of white feminists normalizing the hijab. Oh. And I don't know if, um, like, I'm just conflicted about it. I mean, it's nice to be represented in TV shows and in the media as whatever. But like, it's also like not serving uh, feminism here, because like if women are threatened, uh, or like if women can be killed till the, till this day when t uh, taking off the hijab, it's not. I don't know. I feel like they're normalizing something that's not normal. It's a a tool of oppression. I'm conflicted, you know. So I just want to know what you think about that. Does it really help us, or does it like just like? But what helps us? White feminism? I think we're right. lost. No, normalizing hijab. Is no. it is it like a feminist thing to normalize hijab? Well, or is it not? So if you read Leila Ahmed's book, A Quiet Revolution, she actually speaks about like 15, 16, 17, I don't know how many numbers, different numbers of the interpretations of the hijab, right? So she she speaks about like 
back in Egypt, um, ayam and colonization, right? When the colonizers came in and how when they left, who were they going to give it to? Uh, logically, upper class or lower class? Upper class, right? So their, their kind of prerequisite was take off the hijab. We're going to give you the country, we're going to give you the wealth to the upper class. So you see the upper class taking off the hijab, and then you see the lower class hanging on to it more. That was one interpretation. You see like the oil boom, you see hijab going up. You see September 11, you see all these women wearing the hijab because they were being discriminated against in the US and they wanted to resist. So there's so many interpretations. And it's and I don't want to also speak for it too, because I'm not I don't wear the hijab because that would be privileged too, right? But I've seen moments like just the other day, someone said something to one of my friends, you know, like she said, Why are you wearing the hijab? It was really awkward actually. Why are you wearing the hijab? Like, um, like, are you religious? I was like, how awkward is that question? Here, right? So like, and her telling me how she's trying to get away from the US, so she doesn't hear all those stereotypes, right? And then here we're at dinner and she's like asking her this awkward question, like, why do you wear it? And I was like, it, I, and you know, we tried to deconstruct it, you know, but she was also like my mom's friend, so it was really awkward. But, <laughs> But what I'm trying to say is like, it's, we are normalizing it in the media, but if you read Layla Ahmed's work and Miriam Cook, she, does, she has a round table discussion, can I almost send it to you? It's the way she speaks about the hijab and the deconstruction of it, and how the hijab is not only, what's so interesting about it, it's not only a racial, but it's a religious and a cultural and a gender signifier. It's like freaking half the intersections, all in one artifact, the hijab. You know what I mean? Hi, um, I just wanted to say that was a lovely speech. Thank you. And um, I was wondering, you know how you said that we can't put women into one group and say that all of us are oppressed? Mm -hmm. And that many women have different needs and many women are oppressed. How can we avoid saying that all women are oppressed in this certain way, but at the same time, how can we give awareness to the fact that several women are oppressed in different ways? And this is the best. Question. This is so. This is like my life story, because like, it's no, it's really, it's so. I have an article where I speak about intersectional dualism, and it's exactly what your question talks about. Like, how do we work against? And I'm talking about also how do we work against whiteness, right? Because they want to come in and like take over. You know, I don't know which region they want to go into next. And then, how do we also fight patriarchy in our own country? Because we can't say that there's no violence and there's no patriarchy here and in other countries. But how are we going to like fight it, right? From country to country, how? That's the challenge. That's where we all need to be reflexive. That's where we need to basically be intersectional. I feel like if the West was more reflexive, we wouldn't have to be fighting them. Then we could, you know, do a little bit more here. But if this is the million-dollar question. The awkward silence. I can sing, you know, like, hey. <laughs> like I sang the other day on the radio, Kelly Mero, you know. Thank you all for coming out and joining us this evening. For those here for the stand, please go see Mohammed in the back. Otherwise, thank you so much, Dr. Henry, for sharing so much of your book with us. And we hope to see you come back again someday. Thank you.